All right, good afternoon. Good morning, technically. How's it going today? Going well, how are you doing? I'm doing well too, thanks. All right, so mainly today I want to talk about um, your next homework assignment, which is homework three, which is a week-long programming project. It's a 100-point project as opposed to 10 or 20 for these other assignments, so it's a fairly major um, undertaking. You have a week to do it. Um, so I want to go through that in detail, but before we get to that, any questions on what we've been doing up to here? Let's start with um, with homework three. So this is this is posted on Canvas now, um, and I also call this programming assignment one, even though you've been doing programming. Um, so this is this is a hundred point project, um, and you have a week to do it. And your goal is to write a small game as a Bash script, okay, which will run on the server, and it's um, it's a stick picking game. So this is this is a kid's game where you have toothpicks or or matchsticks or something and you make a pile of them and you take turns picking sticks from the pile and the goal is to be the person who takes the last stick. Okay, whoever takes the last stick wins. And our rules are basically you're allowed to take either one, two, three or four sticks per per turn. Um and so, so if you're playing this with, I don't know, 15 sticks to start, all right? And let's say, let's say you and I are playing, and I go first. So I might take one stick, and you might take two, and I might take two, and you take three, and I take one, and you take two, and now I can take these last four sticks and I win the game. All right. Um, and your goal of your program is to play this game, right, and to try to win. And there's a simple strategy you can use in deciding how many sticks to take that will help you um, win unless the other person also knows the trick. And then it basically comes down to, um, you know, how the game is set up to begin with. So let me show you um, a sample execution of this. So the game is just called stick, okay? You run it, it doesn't take any command line arguments, just type in the name of the program, which is stick, hit enter, and it starts playing. So print some kind of greeting in the top, welcome to my match stick game, and then ask how many sticks you want to play with, okay? you're required to play with at least 10 sticks. So if you put in a negative number, if you put in five, if you put in nine, that's not a valid answer. If you put in something that's not a number, that's not a valid answer, right? So negative two, nine, right? And at this point, just keep asking how many sticks they wanna play with. And they can take as many tries as they want and you just keep asking. Okay, once they decide how many sticks to play with, then you ask them who should go first, the user or the computer. Lowercase u for user, lowercase c for computer. And here again, you know, as many tries as it takes, right, until they give you an answer. So, okay, I'll say the user is going to go first. All right, and now the gameplay starts. And the way the game plays out is as follows. First, Show the pile of sticks. So in this case, there's 36 to start with. 30 sticks to start with. Show 30 pipes. And then show the number of sticks in parentheses so that when I'm testing this, I don't have to count up the actual number of sticks. So show the picture of the stick pile and then the number in parentheses. 
And since I said the user's going first, it's the user's turn. That's me. Ask how many sticks I'm going to take. Well, I'll take two sticks. All right. So after I've taken two sticks, show what the pile is. There's 28 sticks left. And then the computer decides how many sticks to take. So the computer says, I take three sticks, and now there's 25 left in the pile. And we just go back and forth like this. Okay, I'll take one stick. Uh, that left 24. And then the computer said, okay, I'll take four sticks. And so the pile went from 24 down to 20. And we keep going. I'll take two. The computer took three. I'll take four. The computer took one. I'll take one. The computer takes four. There's five sticks left. I'm going to lose this game. Right? If I take one, the computer will take four. If I take four, the computer will take one. However many sticks I take, the computer is going to get the last stick. So I'll just take two, and the computer takes the last three sticks. The pile's empty, and the computer says, I win. I being the computer. All right? That's the basic gameplay. If the user happens to win, right, if the user takes the last stick, tell them that they won. All right, so that's a demo of, of the basic um, gameplay. All right, so you run the command without any arguments. It asks how many uh, sticks should be taken. Um, the user specifies an integer bigger than or equal to 10. It asks who should go first. The user must enter a U or a C. And at this point, you know, any mistakes, any illegal entries, you just keep trying again and again. Okay. Once the game starts, do the play that we just saw. User takes sticks, computer takes sticks. After each move by each person, show the remaining pile of sticks. And after each move by either the human player or the computer, the program should check to see if the game's over. And if it is, then it should, you know, based on who took the last stick, announce who won the game. All right, and I want you to show the stick pile at each point with this. All right, once the game is moving, um, Illegal moves get handled differently. You're allowed once to make an illegal move. If you make a second illegal move in a row, you forfeit the game. So the only illegal move is not specifying one, two, three, or four sticks. If you try to take more than four, if you try to take fewer than one, if you don't specify a valid integer, those are illegal moves. If you make an illegal move, tell the user, you know, that's not legal, specify one, two, three, or four. If you do that again, the game's over. And then if they do that again, tell them the game's been forfeited, the computer wins. All right. If they then make a legal move, so they put in an illegal number, they made a legal move, the next time they make an illegal entry, they still get two tries. Okay. It's not like once per game you made a mistake, second mistake, you're done. It's got to be two mistakes in a row before you kick them out. Okay. This is important. So all of these details... Are, are part of the programming assignment. It's part of the challenge to try to get your code to do exactly what I'm describing here, right? So it might make perfect sense to say, you know, well, if you make two illegal moves any time during the game, the game's over, okay? But the goal here is to follow this spec exactly. So two illegal moves in a row forfeits the game. An illegal move followed by a legal move, followed by an illegal, followed by a legal, you're still good to go. So let's, let's just look at that. So let's play with, you know, 50 sticks, 40 sticks, and I'll let the computer go first. How many sticks do you want to take? I'll say zero. That's cheating. Try again. Okay, I'll take two. Okay, now how many sticks? I'll take 35. That's cheating. Okay, I'll take four. How many sticks should I take? I'll take a whole bunch. Nope, that's cheating. Okay, I'll take one, right? But two illegal moves in a row, I'll take 25 sticks. That's cheating. Okay, I'll take zero sticks. You forfeited the game. All right, is that clear? What the guidelines are there?
All right, so algorithm, which somebody already figured out like 10 minutes ago and posted in chat. Um, basically, your goal is to um, leave the other person with a pile that's a multiple of five. Okay, so if I'm the computer and I'm trying to win, I try to set things up so that when it's your turn, there's a multiple of five sticks in the pile. And that's enough to guarantee that I'll always win. So here's, here's the basic explanation. Suppose it's your turn and there's five sticks left, right? I've won the game. Because you can either take one, in which case I take four, or you can take two and I'll take three, or you can take three and I'll take two, or you can take four and I'll take one. The only legal moves you can make each leave me in a situation where I can win the game on the next move. So if I can get you down to five sticks, game's over, I'm going to win. Okay, well, by the same line of reasoning... If on your turn there are 10 sticks left, I can guarantee after your move and my move, there'll only be five sticks left. Because I do the same thing. If you take one, I take four. If you take two, I take three. If you take three, I take two. If you take four, I take one. I can get rid of these five sticks. So every time that you make a move and I make a move, I can drop the pile size by five. And so at some point, you know, if the number of sticks left is a multiple of five, like a hundred, guaranteed after 20 moves, I'll win the game. Doesn't matter how many sticks you take. The way that works is that I always take a number of sticks so that the pile is a multiple of five. All right, well, we can code that pretty straightforwardly. Um, Given n sticks remaining, pick n modulo 5 sticks. So if it's my turn and there's 21 sticks, if it's my turn and there's 21 sticks, I'll take one stick, and now n is a multiple of, 20, of 5. If it's my turn and n equals 23 sticks, I'll pick up 3, and now n is a multiple of 5. So I always want to pick up however many sticks it takes to reduce this to a multiple of 5. Well, that's just n modulo 5. So always take n mod 5 sticks. But n modulo 5 is guaranteed to be an integer that will be either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. If it's 1, 2, 3, or 4, that's a legal move. But if it's 0, that's not a legal move. The computer's not allowed to say, I'm not going to pick any sticks. So we have a special case. If n mod 5 is 0, pick 1 stick. All right. And that's, that's a little um, trick that basically says, you know, I can't guarantee yet that I'm going to win the game. Um, I'm going to try to leave as many sticks as possible in the pile and hope that the, the person I'm playing messes up. I'm going to hope they don't know how to win the game, or maybe they do, but they'll, they'll make a math error and they'll pick a bad number of sticks. All right. So by picking one stick, we leave as many sticks as possible. We, we drag the game out longer in hopes of finding an advantage. All right, algorithm clear. All right, other requirements. Um, there you go. So other requirements. Um, so this has got to be written in Bash. Okay, bash script using all of the, the structures we've been talking about, if loops, while if statements, while loops, and so on and so forth. Um, back up your work frequently, okay? Don't find yourself in a situation where it's, it's Friday morning, you're trying to submit this, and all your code has disappeared because you did something in the middle of the night 
and deleted all your files. Make backups, okay? Preferably on Git. Um, that's that's what we're working towards. It's it's kind of an easy way to um, save yourself if something goes wrong and you delete all your files at 3 a.m. Um, so make backups, okay? Um, comment your code, okay? This is a requirement. Um, so let's talk about commenting. Commenting code is is a bit of an art form. It's it's a personal thing. It's something that you develop over time. Um, so so here's my sample script. Um, let's say somewhere down the road, I'm writing my code, which says, okay. I want to find the number of sticks left, modulo five, and I want to take that off from the pile. Okay, so I could write something like this. Um, all right, and what am I doing here? I'm finding the number of sticks, modulo five. I'm subtracting that from A and putting that back into A. Um, somebody who doesn't know what you're doing, if they look at this line of code, they don't know why this is here. If you come back to this code a year from now, and you know, you're taking a game design class, someone says, have you ever written a game before in Unix? And you can say, yeah, I did, you know, and so you pull this code out to show to someone, and you see this line here, what does that mean? A equals dollar sign paren paren A minus A percent five close parens. I have no idea, right? It's, it's fairly meaningless. Um, so, this would be a little more understandable in the future or to somebody else, because now I'm clearly adjusting the number of sticks, right? Um, an even clearer way to write this might be something like, like this. Right, so now I've defined a, a variable take, which is number of sticks modulo five, and then I'm saying number of sticks equals number of sticks minus take. Right, now that's getting closer to what, what you know, the fabled self-documenting code. Um, but we'd still like to put some comments on here. All right, so, so here's something that's not a useful comment. Um, Okay, these are not terribly useful comments because they don't tell us why we're doing what we're doing. Right? Take equals number of sticks percent five. The comment says set take equal to number of sticks modulo five. Well, we can kind of tell that from looking at this code. We don't need to, to know very deeply what's going on to infer that this is taking the number of sticks mod five and setting take equal to that or to infer that this is subtracting take from the number of sticks. So these comments don't really add a lot of insight to the code, right? So what, what could be a better comment here? Um, Find the number of sticks to take in order to leave the pile with a multiple of five sticks. And you know, maybe maybe make your comments easier to read. Right? So put them on multiple lines, line them up, that kind of stuff. Um, and and down here, right, subtract take from number of sticks. Um, how about adjust um, stick count? After, after removing some sticks, I cannot type.
And you know, if these comments are here for your benefit, to help you understand what's going on in your code, make them easy to look at. All right now I've got my code over here, which you know I can't understand because I know how to write Bash and I know how to read Bash. But when I'm looking at my code and I'm trying to fix it or explain it to someone or modify it, I can look over here, right on the right side, and I can say, "Oh, here's what's going on." And you know, in the very beginning here, I might do something like this. Right, there's a little comment block in this section of code. And now when I run this, I might find that the game is, is trying to take zero sticks, which is an illegal move. You know, and I might throw something in here which says, um, let's make sure this is a legal move. And I'll put some logic in here um, to decide if it's a legal move and make some adjustments if not. And say, you know, now take is... Guaranteed to be a legal move, and then I go ahead and I adjust my pile by removing take sticks from the pile, All right? So I want you commenting your code as you write, right? As you're thinking about what you're doing, try to put comments in to explain not what the bash statement says, right? But what the intent of putting that bash statement into your script is. Why am I putting this in here? Not to increment a variable, but to keep count of how many turns have been played, right? So think of it from a higher level. Okay, this is something that's, that's personal. It's something that you develop over time. It's something that the majority of students um, start off resisting. And comments get added at the last minute, right? Um, but, but it can help you in the process of writing code. Right? Especially when you have long files with lots of code and you have a project broken out over multiple files, um, good commenting in some form is going to help you keep that stuff straight. And it's going to help you when something isn't working and you got to come back to a module that you wrote two weeks ago, which was 7,000 lines back, right? Um, and you're trying to figure out why did I do I++ here? And a comment that says increment i is not going to help you, right? A comment that says, you know, we've just added a new node to our structure, so let's keep track of that, will will be more meaningful. All right. Um, I also want a block of comments in the very beginning of your script. And I want that comment block to tell me your name, the course, the date, the assignment number, and then a synopsis in your own words of what this script is. So for example, and this can't be the very first line in your file, right, because um, the first line has to be the shebang. But you know, I could start this down here. Right. Um, anytime you're writing code, put your name on it. I get so many students turning in code and their name is nowhere to be found. Right. This is your creative work. This is like writing a poem or writing a piece of music or making a painting. Put your name on it. Right. This is yours. Get credit for it. So, so throw a comment block in. Tell me, you know, what the class is, the assignment, the date, um, your name, that kind of stuff. Um, And then in your own words, tell me what's going on. Um, right? That's, that's, you know, enough that if you come in here and you look at this a year from now, it's like, what was homework 003, right? Oh yeah, the stick picking game. Oh yeah, one to four sticks each turn. Okay, yeah, I remember this, right? And and it, it tells you, do I want to keep reading 
this? Do I want to use this file? And so on and so forth. So I want a comment block like that somewhere in the beginning of your script. All right, so um, so question from, from Chad. Would it not make more sense to pick a random number of sticks, assuming the player doesn't know the algorithm? Um, so... Um, so let's see. Um, if you if the computer picks a random number of sticks, um, it sounds like you're hoping that eventually a stick gets the pile gets down to a multiple of five. Um, but I don't think that gives you a better chance of winning than if you just deliberately pick the number of sticks mod five, which is guaranteed to force it down to a multiple of five. Um, unless you're talking about the case where. It's the computer's turn. Oh, when the computer's presented with mod five sticks, um, possibly, right? So if if the computer's turn finds a pile with a multiple of five sticks, at that point the computer cannot guarantee a win. So you're really hoping that that the user does something which leaves you with um, with something other than mod zero mod five. Um, and psychologically, maybe it would be better to pick a random number. And you could actually, you know, track the moves that this player has been made and find patterns. Like whenever I pick two sticks, they always pick one. And then you could play them using some, some social engineering. That would be kind of cool. Um, but, but we're going we're gonna to do the low, the low ball route and just, if, if you're stuck with a multiple of five sticks, pick one stick and just go with that. But if you want to make a version that has an AI in it, go for it. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so those those are the main other requirements. Um, so submitting your your assignment is done on Git, and it's going to be the same as as what you you've done or will do for homework too. So um, do this in its own directory. Initialize a Git repository in there. Do a Git remote add origin. Um, go ahead and make a README if you like. It's not required, but it's it's a nice way to start your repo. Um, push that over to GitLab, and then hop on GitLab's website. Add me as a reporter to the project. Okay, um, and then you're you're all good to go. Develop your code. Just Git add, Git commit, Git push. You just keep doing that cycle. All right, so I'll tell you what I told the other class. Um, limited time offer slash bribe, okay? If you set up your homework three Git repo before Monday, okay? So today, tomorrow, or over the weekend, if you get your repo set up, you can send me an email and say, I think my repo is set up, can you check? And I'll go ahead and try to pull your repository down and I'll send you a note and let you know yes or no, this is good, okay? Um, there's no reason not to set this up today. Even if you're not planning to start coding for another few days, set the repository up today and then you don't have to worry about it. And then when you do start coding, you know, you feel like coding, you don't have to stop and say, oh, but I got to do that Git thing first, right? So, so no reason not to set it up today. And as an incentive, if you do that and you're not sure that it's set up correctly, you're not sure I'm at it as a reporter, send me an email, okay? And, and ask me to check it out and I'll try it. Okay, that's only until Monday morning. So I don't want 50 people writing me Thursday night at 10 p.m. saying, can you check to see if, if you can download my repository? Okay, that's not going to be feasible. So do this early and, and shoot me a note if you want me to double check. All right, any other questions on any of that? All right, so um, so let's change gears. Let's talk about some more bash details. Um, so I want to talk about uh, quotation marks and in particular back quotes or back ticks. And so there's there's um, 
there's three kinds of quotation marks we can we can work with. There's good old double quotes, which is kind of the most common, right? So double quotes just say, um, let's go ahead and, and enclose something and treat it as a single logical unit. Uh, hold on a second here. So so let's let's take a string that might contain spaces or things like that and treat it as a single logical unit, okay? Um, and inside double quotes, if we find a dollar sign, that usually means replace this with the value of this variable. Okay, so we've we've been doing this, you know, all quarter so far. So x equals twelve. Echo double quote x equals dollar sign x. The dollar sign x gets replaced by the value of x, which is twelve. Okay, and we can we can put you know spaces in here and and they're preserved and so on and so forth. So that's double quotes. Okay. Um, if for some reason we don't want dollar signs to be evaluated and we really just want to take this as a literal string, we can use single quotes. And a single quote just is literally, you know, whatever is inside the quotes. So x space equals sign space dollar sign x, right? That's exactly what it echoed. All right, there's a third kind of quotation mark, which is a back quote. And back quotes don't get used a lot. So, so on my keyboard, it's on the tilde key. It's way up here in the upper left. And it's a quote that kind of goes from the upper left to the lower right. Um, my French teacher would expect me to know if that's an accent grave or accent aigu. I have no idea. But it's a back quote. Um, and back quotes are different. Okay, we don't use them in general. Um, if I try to do that, I'm gonna get all kinds of weird things happening, okay? So back quotes are really special and they're super powerful. So here's what happens. If I put something inside backwards quotation marks, the shell will do the following. It will take this and it will try to execute it as if I had typed it on the command line. So it will run what's inside here as a command. And if this command generates any output, instead of seeing that output on my screen, the shell will capture that output. And then this whole back quoted thing will basically be replaced by, by the output of that. Sorry, I didn't have my camera on. So if I say x equals back quote date, this command gets executed the output of that command basically replaces this part of my expression. And so this would become x equals whatever the result of running the date command was. So x equals back quote date. The date command just got executed. And I didn't see the output on my screen. Instead, the output got loaded into the variable x. And if I echo dollar sign x, I can see what the date was when I ran that command. It's just a string, right? It's not going to change. It's not actually the date command. It's just the output that was produced when I ran date. If I set x equal to back quote PWD, x is now whatever the result of PWD was. If I set x equal to back quote LS, x is the result of running LS. Well, in this case, it shows me the contents of my directory all on one line, right? It's one big long string with a bunch of spaces in it. All right, and this, this can be really useful. Um, this is useful because inside a script we can run commands, but instead of just seeing the results displayed on our terminal, we can grab those results and do things with them and analyze them and process them. All right, questions on that basic mechanism?
So we can get arbitrarily complex in here, right? I could say let's do who and pipe that into word count. And now if I look at the value of x, it's, you know, the result of running word count on the output generated by the who command. I can pipe this into word count dash L. And now X tells me how many people are logged into the system. And this is set when you set X, right? The command execution is taking place right here. And so after that, x is just a variable. All right, so this is the way we can, we can sort of capture, or tap into the power of being in a bash shell, having access to the whole gamut of Linux commands. Um, but not just execute commands from a script, but also grab the output of those commands and do stuff with it. So if I want to know what the current date is, what, what the current month is, um, you know, I can use the date command and that shows me the date. I can pipe that into a command we're going to spend a lot of time working with later called awk. And I can say awk curly bracket print dollar sign two. That'll print the second word of whatever the output of date is. In this case, that should be October. And so if I said month equals back quote all of that stuff, then I've got a variable which has the current month in it. So this can let us start thinking about modular, modularizing our code, right? Being able to take some, some larger scale task we want to do and break it into smaller pieces. And that's sort of the essence of programming, right? You're, you've got some large problem you're trying to solve. You break it into smaller problems. And you don't just write code to solve those smaller problems. You break those into even smaller problems. And you break those down further and further and further until you've got these tiny little pieces that you want to solve and then you write code to solve those and you put them together and build it back up. So, so I used this example in the last class. Um, you know, I have some tools that I put together for, for teaching. These are mostly just, just uh, bash scripts, right? So, um, You know, here's a script called teach. And, and really, it just does a few things, right? It changes into my teaching directory. It checks to make sure my monitors are set up correctly. It sets up my two cameras, my document camera and my, my video camera that I accidentally closed a little while ago. It starts my screen recorder and starts Zoom, right? Each of these, thing, these, these things up here, these are our other scripts. Um, Monitor check um, runs this command called x rand r, and it looks for a screen setup like this. This tells me my monitor is extended to the right, right? And if it's not, um, if, if it's set up like that, I'm good to go. Um, otherwise, it says, you know, make sure both monitors are set up, set them to this size. That's a reminder for me, waits for me to hit a character, and then I'm good to go and so on and so forth. So I have a script called what class is this? This reads a schedule file that basically has this information and it looks at the current date and time figures out what class I'm in. Right? And it's just, you know, it just picks up the current date and um, reads my schedule file, breaks it up into different fields, um, does some, some arithmetic gymnastics and ultimately figures out what class I'm in. So if I say, what class is this? It tells me CSE 224B. Okay, 
that's that's just text manipulation. Um, and then I have this this um, this timestamp code that I use for timestamping my videos. And that uses the what class is this script that I've already written. So I have what class is this inside back quotes. So in this one echo statement, what's the script going to do? Well, it's going to run what class is this? It's going to capture that output, which is a class name, and replace this with that output. So this becomes echo quote CSE 224B space. This becomes the year, month, day, hour, and minute of the current clock, right? And then these are just variable substitutions. And that goes into a log file, and that log file gets put to my clipboard, and it gets displayed on the screen, and it gets loaded into a YouTube video, right? So we're, we're taking scripts, and we're using them inside other scripts. We're modularizing, okay, which is going to be something we, we keep coming back to again and again in this course, trying to work on our code in pieces, right, instead of just one big, long, monolithic script. Um, and certainly when we get to 222 and absolutely 223, which are the data structures courses, um, we're going to have programs that are way too complex to just put into one file. We're really going to want to have a good practice for, for breaking these things down. All right, so let me mention something else, um, which is kind of related to this, which is the idea of subshells. Um, So, um, so I'm on the Linux server. I can say something like x equals 12. I can say echo dollar sign x and x is 12. Okay. Suppose I make a script. Okay, I'm going to make a script which says x sets x equal to hello and then shows me the value of x. I'm just going to call this go, so I'm going to say go. It confirms x is equal to hello, but if I echo the value of x, it's not hello, it's still 12. All right, so what's going on here? When I say go, this the f commands in this file are not executed by this current bash shell that I'm sitting in. A new shell is started, and that new shell executes the commands inside Go. So that new shell says, let's go ahead and set x equal to hello. Let's go ahead and echo what x is equal to, and then that shell exits. And I come back to my current shell, and x hasn't changed. Similarly, I can change my directory in here. I can move to the root directory. I can print the working directory. I can do an ls, right? And if I run that script, yeah, so x is hello. My current directory was slash. There's the contents of the current directory. But when that script exits, if I print my directory, I'm still in my home directory with my files from my home directory, right? Why is that? Because the go command executes in a different shell. It's actually a subshell. So my bash shell starts a new bash shell. That new shell executes all the commands inside go, and then it exits. And my shell, the only command executed was go. All right? And if that's not what you want to have happen, if you want to actually have your variable x change to hello and your directory change to slash, here's what you can do. You can say source go. And source is a keyword in bash which says don't start a new bash shell. Stay in your current bash shell, but just read commands from this file go and execute them. Okay? This can be a little dangerous, right? If if you do this on a random file, you're gonna start executing all kinds of commands, right? And and that can be a little scary. Um but in this case, you know, Go is basically going to set x equal to hello. It's going to change to the slash directory and do an ls. So if I say source Go, it will be as if I had typed those commands in right here. So it said x equal to hello, show me what x was, changed to the slash directory, did an ls. 
Now if I look at the value of x, it's equal to hello. If I look at my current directory, I'm sitting under slash. If I do an ls, I see the directories in the slash directory. Okay, so typing the name of a script, it runs in a subshell. And variables that you set, aliases you set up, changing your directory, changing your environment, all of that stuff doesn't affect the shell that you started in. If you source a script, it actually executes those commands in your current shell. Subtle difference, probably not something you're going to have to, to deal with, but, but eventually you find a case where you're trying to set a value in a shell and it doesn't seem to take. That's what's going on. All right, any questions on any of that? So, so set up your repo for homework three. Shoot me an email if you want me to check it for you. Um, and tomorrow we will, um, we will start working. I'll talk about bash functions. So that's another way we can modularize. Uh, we can get the values of functions using back quotes. Um, and then we'll go on. We'll talk about processes. And next week we're going to start talking about C. So um, ODPs will kick in next week again. Um, finish homework too if you haven't turned that in yet. Have a great afternoon. I will see you tomorrow. Thank you.